Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. New York values, Bernie Sanders, the Brooklynite, Queens native Donald Trump, and of course Hillary Clinton, who adopted Westchester as her New York residence. Our presidential contenders this year hail from the Big Apple and the Empire State. So naturally, what about the Bronx? We ask our guest today, a professional clarinetist turned award-winning writer and photographer. Arlene Alda is the author of Just Kids from the Bronx, telling it the way it was. A chronicler of Bronx tales, from the Mayflower to the New York Yankees, Alda collects oral histories of Bronx heritage, from Hollywood legends to dignitaries, among them Al Pacino, Colin Powell, and Neil deGrasse Tyson. Alda dedicates her testimony to the future leaders of the borough and to the memory of her parents, who she says had the good sense to move to the Bronx in the first place. Arlene, a pleasure to meet you. Oh, thank you. Pleasure to be here, Alexander. Let's start from that. New York values. You know, one of the things that I learned in interviewing 64 different people who hailed from the Bronx, who, who kind of made names for themselves, is that um, everyone agreed that there's something about the Bronx where you're down to earth, that there are you, you are who you are, you say it like it is. So I would say that well, that's one of the Bronx values. Truth, honesty, down to earthness. Authenticity. Authenticity, yeah. And what spoke to you most in compiling these anecdotes, these, this treasure trove of oral history? I started in a very random fashion. I started interviewing people I knew, basically, just to see what there was that might be interesting to others. So I interviewed Regis Philbin, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Carl Reiner, um, Martin Bregman, producer of Al Pacino's movies, Al Pacino, uh, someone called David Yarnell, also a producer, documentarian. These are the people I feel very comfortable talking to initially. And when they told me in conversation stories about growing up, I felt there was a treasure trove, treasure trove here of, of what it's like to grow up in what is called an outer borough uh, at a particular time. What was that After, time? After that particular time, which was, would have been in the 30s and 40s and 50s, uh, I also knew that there was a whole part of the Bronx story that wasn't told. And that had to do with the people who grew up in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. So the book expanded from people in their, in, now in their 80s, 70s, 60s, 50s, to people in their 40s, 30s, and 20s. And that shift really created, a, for me, a very interesting kind of a mosaic, a kaleidoscope of, of what, what the people were like and what the borough was like when they were, when these people were growing up. So for instance, Carl Reiner, who is now 94, just turned 94, 
grew up at a very innocent time in an ethnic community that was both uh, Jewish and Italian. Very, very similar to, to my background in a way, because I grew up in a neighborhood that was Jewish and Italian. At one point, the borough of the Bronx was 60% Jewish, with the other ethnic groups being Italian, Irish, German, Polish, a little bit of Asian, a little bit of African American, a little bit of Hispanic. And over the years, that has shifted. But what hasn't shifted, in my opinion, is the fact that the Bronx has always been a borough welcoming immigrants and a borough where the working class person was striving, is striving, to make a better life for themselves and their kids. How you see it now really depends on where you are in the Bronx, but I wonder if you reflect on then and now, the Bronx as a pioneering borough of educators, what was it like then? The school was the place where the lofty ideals were set forth, where the mix of ethnic groups happened, where the mix of economic groups happened. So that, you, could, you might say that that's really the democratic cauldron right in the schools. Um, the, the tragedy of what has happened with the public school system is that it, it, for whatever reasons, and you could name, I guess, a, a lot of different factors, but whatever those reasons and factors are, the, the, that, the tragedy of schools being dysfunctional, uh, that has repercussions beyond what it seems to have, because that sense of uh, being prepared for the world, that sense of meeting others and understanding um, that it's not just you and your ethnic group, the, the, the learning as, as a goal in life, um, not just as a way of passing time. All those, all the wonderful things we were taught um, somehow got tossed out. But the hope is, and it's, I, I see it now, the school system certainly is much, much better in many ways now than it certainly was in the 80s and 90s. And uh, I see tremendous teaching going on in the schools. I you like see to a visit. Rebirth? Well, yes, I absolutely do. And I think um, the competition of the charter schools is a good competition. Uh, at first, I was kind of on the fence about it. And having seen a number of charter schools in action, um, I'm all for the good ones. Um, and the good, there are great teachers out there, teachers who devote their lives to uh, bringing out the fullest potential of each kid. So, I think you yeah. evoked the portrait of a failing school system by describing the virtue of a successful one. And what I mean by that is diversity was the great promise. It's what fertilized the American dream. And I, I wonder how this feeds into the narratives and the oral histories of some of the people we've talked about because the, I think the failure, at least in part, can be attributed to the very methodical self-segregation of communities, the lack of diversity, and the lack of wanting a kind of great American story uh, for every ethnic stripe. I grew up at the time of the so-called melting pot. And that melting pot meant that uh, you come from whatever country you come from, when you come to America, you're in this big cauldron and you come out American because you speak English, you go to a school where English is, uh, is uh, the, the language and you learn the American way. Well, that had failures as well, mm -hmm. but uh, the issues today are quite they're very challenging. You know, uh, the economic issues are very challenging. 
in my family, we were, I would say, working class, but not poor. Uh, the whole neighborhood, I don't know anyone who was, you could categorize as being poor. Uh, Louis Subinas, who, just to cite one of the people I interviewed, um, Puerto Rican descent, grew up in the Bronx in the 80s and 90s. He describes poverty in a way that was brought tears to my eyes. I had never either experienced it firsthand or heard about it with a, a kind of a dispassionate detail that he was able to, to describe, talking about the insufficiency that was always there, that if one day you had heat in your apartment or, or food on the table, the specter of that insufficiency was always there. And oddly enough and wonderfully enough, this young boy was saved by a wonderful teacher who recognized that this kid in the fourth grade read on the 12th grade level and that the, schools, the school was not doing him any, any big favors by keeping him there. Uh, so they wanted to skip him to the sixth grade from the fourth grade and, you know, from a nine-year-old to, uh, to a class where there are 12 year olds or whatever, and some kids who were left back who were 13 and 14. That, that was totally uh, awful, but that's the way it was handled. The teacher took him by the hand, went down the subway, took him to interview at uh, three private schools in Manhattan, and he got into all three, and, and the kid chose one, the Allen Stevenson School, and then he went on scholarship also at the Allen Stevenson School to Cathedral High, uh, Harvard University, Harvard Business School, became a very successful businessman. And then the, the topper of it, which I love more than anything else, is he became head of the Ford Foundation, which is a foundation that gives out millions of dollars to uh, worthy organizations for their uh, for the, the good deeds that they do. So here's this very, very poor boy who but for the, the attention of a caring teacher, we don't know what that trajectory would be. But in his own words, he describes how the horizon for a kid in a good school is limitless, whereas the horizon for a kid in a dysfunctional school stops at the school door. Uh, it's, it's quite a different view of life, and um, we can only hope that the horizon for the kids in the Bronx is now that distant one where you can see that you can go on to, to fulfill your potential. We were talking a bit off camera. The objective of gentrification uh, sometimes gets in the way of learning English. You know, that we, I think in some sense, the progressive teaching of diversity in 2016 uh, lacks that connection to the American dream that, like you said, you learn English. How do you see gentrification today in the Bronx? Um, do you see an inclusiveness that is still together a unified Bronx story? And let's get back to those Bronx values. You, you said they're going to they're, they're going to tell you straight and i know people who testify to that <laughs> if you're from the bronx but in the context of this political season i do want you to weigh in on the disparate value systems or lack thereof in some of our new yorker candidates oh wow <laughs> let's let's big, start with big the gentrification question. let's, let's gentrification. start let's, okay how do you see gentrification in the bronx today Okay, uh, now I'm a total amateur when it comes sure. to uh, this, but this is uh, what I glean. There are wonderful things that are being done in various neighborhoods to be able to bring more business in, to make more affordable housing, and to uh, make it a comfortable place for families to live, for artists to come and work. Um, there's also such a thing as uh, the Bronx River, which 
uh, is you don't often think of a river in terms of gentrification, but the river when I was a kid was not this idyllic, beautiful river that went, uh, you know, north-south. It was a muddy mess with garbage in it. So things have, in many ways, have gotten better. The Bronx River Alliance, for instance, has gentrified the river. It, people go there to, to relax. There's kayaking, there's fishing. I, I don't think there's swimming, but um, it's a different river than when I was a kid. The South Bronx has a lot of old factories that are on waterfront. There's a lot of waterfront in the Bronx that is undeveloped. Uh, it's derelict. There's, there's, um, and I know that in the South Bronx, there is a big development uh, in place for uh, both market value housing and affordable housing. And I think the community now has a voice, whereas in the past, for instance, when the Cross Bronx Expressway was uh, uh, put through in the 60s and it split parts of the Bronx into two pieces, there was no community involved. You say involvement. they have a voice because of the rise of progressive populism today? Well, I think they've always, always tried to have a voice. But I think the reception for the voice is there now. Um, uh, the populism that we see in terms of this, the current um, primary season is extraordinary from my point of view because it's, it's one day it's this, the next day it's that. And um, I'm reeling from the, um, what has happened. Um, this will and like, of yeah. course, as a Bronxite, I was yes. brought up as a liberal Democrat, I'm proud to say, and I still to this day am a liberal Democrat, although uh, I listen to reason uh, very clearly and I choose uh, very carefully. But I'm very proud to use the word liberal, although they've changed it to progressive now. So. <laughs> <laughs> we recently had on our program, Michael Lynch, the author of the book, The Internet of Us. And I think he encapsulated in his theory about Donald Trump, and by the time this airs, he may wholly be irrelevant with the implosion that has long doomed him, uh, supposedly, right? But we, we discussed the peril of having a, a political office holder, or someone seeking the highest office in the land, who lacks a value system because really you think of someone with conviction well they have a set of values you think of someone with humility they are willing to learn when you lack conviction and humility that means you really have no value system and it, it, it was growing up in the Bronx that I think instilled a certain core value system in you and a lot of the people you write about in the book so I, I, I throw this question back to you because I'm eager to hear your thoughts on the, the nature of, of, of New Yorkers. Uh, and New York's primary has actually coveted this cycle. Uh, we don't know who will win, but how do you explain the New Yorker, uh, the carpet-bagging New Yorker of Hillary Clinton, right? But the, the, the genuine New Yorkers, the folks who grew up here, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, what say you, Arlene, about their their youth and, and the way they speak to values, do they comport with the Bronx or no? Well, you're talking about two different people, one from Queens and one from Brooklyn. And what does that and, say? And, uh, <laughs> What's the difference? But, but Brooklyn is very similar or was very similar to the Bronx. So I can understand where Bernie Sanders is coming from uh, clearly. I, I would disagree with you about Donald Trump not having values. I don't think that's so. I think um, he's a businessman, and he, he values the, the talk of uh, deals. I mean, he constantly talks about deals, 
whether or not that's appropriate or training for being <laughs> president of the United States is up for argument. But but I I think he does have a value system. I don't happen to agree with it. Uh, I don't happen to agree with his style, nor do I agree with Bernie Sanders' style, who says a lot of things, and I agree with Hillary. Tell me how you're going to implement these things. We agree that banks did egregious things uh, during the last recession, and they're still doing them. How are you going to deal with that? It's one thing to, to identify the problem, it's another thing to promise people things you cannot, you're, that are not in your control. So um, in many ways, I, um, it, it's a political season. And from my taste, Hillary is the one who's the, not only the most, uh, uh, the most uh, uh, qualified for the job, but the one who's telling the most down-to-earth Things. She, you, you mention any issue, she knows that issue, and she knows it from a very practical point of view. Let's talk a little bit more in the time we have remaining about this, because we will we'll have to agree to disagree on that. Of Trump course. Point. But in the same way that we talk about the Bronx's revival, I think the people the Bronx probably associate with the Brooklynite, as you said, there's some commonality in origins, but... The fact that Park Avenue and Wall Street haven't touched the lives of the great preponderance of people in the Bronx, at least not yet. And I think Bernie Sanders and his, and, and Donald Trump too, in his own way, has channeled this populism. They're wondering in our lifetimes, or in our children's, grandchildren's lifetimes, will the support system that exists in Park Avenue and Wall Street, will that ever trickle into the Bronx so that the Bronx is the golden age of everything we, everything we aspire for? Um, trickle down, you, you, it's interesting. I use the term because that it was never worked. It that never worked. It never worked. We, we've been, we, Ronald it's, it's, Reagan, I became aware of that mostly yeah. through Ronald Reagan because I'm not an economist. Right. But he did, you, you know, that administration did use those terms. It's, and it did not work. Uh, the trickle down, uh, if you make it good for the guy on top, it's not going to come down to the working guy on the bottom. It just doesn't work that way. Um, why it doesn't work that way, I don't really know, but it, in practical terms, I've seen that it doesn't work that way. And I've but, seen uh, bubbles yeah. arise. But go, going back to this idea of having a f level playing field, yes. like you said, a chance, right? Do you think the people of the Bronx have a chance today? Well, I think, you know, the job, jobs are what uh, we're talking about. Work so that um, one can put food on the table and... Uh, because contrary to what you describe as the climate then, you can't be middle class, you can't be working without being poor today. In yeah. so many instances. Yeah, it's, it's a very complex problem, and I'm, I'm afraid that I'm really not qualified to, uh, to answer it. My hope is that the, the poorest borough now, the Bronx, uh, will have enough economic development so that uh, it will bring, somehow, bring the, the basic level standard of living up, that the schools will be as good as they can be, and we see good, good evidence of that now. Um, uh, beyond that, I, you know, I, I really don't know. And I have to ask you before, uh, photography is being employed in a way to lift up the livelihoods of communities. How do you foresee the art, um, the art that you produce, the art that hangs in museums, how do you foresee that having the maximum impact on youngsters today? 
You know, art has has always been a, a way of um, not just communicating, but specifically telling stories. You know, when you think think of the medieval times when everyone was, or most everyone was illiterate before the printing press, the 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 works of art were that were shown were stories, biblical stories. People learn the Bible from looking at art. And as the centuries have, have uh, uh, moved on, art has always been a way of uh, telling stories. It, it also has the wonderful um, power to inspire. And um, I think that when kids are involved in art, it is a way of, of touching a part of them that no uh, amount of reading or writing can ever, ever touch. Reading and writing are fundamental, but right. art is for the soul. And when a kid gets involved with art, there's an uplifting uh, quality to it that you can't describe. And I can only describe it because I've been fortunate enough to, to have been involved and be involved with art. My alma mater high school, Andover, has the Addison Gallery of Art, which is quite spectacular. I thank my teachers. I thank, thank Ansel Adams for uh, all the photos that hang there. And oh, I thank great. you, Arlene Alda, for joining us today on the show. Thank you so much, Alexander. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Carnegie Corporation of New York, May and Samuel Rudin Family Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, Rosalind P. Walter Foundation. With special thanks to the Schumann Media Center for additional support and to the corporate community, Mutual of America.